Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Marie Latuleep and I am the Director of Science Programs at IFINS or the Institute for the Advancement of Food and Nutrition Sciences. And welcome to the fourth in our 2021 webinar series in which we're continuing to learn about diet and the impact on the gut microbiome and how this ultimately impacts health. And for those of you who may not be familiar with IFINS, we always like to reiterate that we are a nonprofit scientific organization and we advance food safety and nutrition science for the benefit of the health of the public. And we do that by bringing together scientists from various sectors to identify research priorities and the projects to advance those research priorities. So our operating philosophy is that including those diverse perspectives from different sectors is fundamental to developing credible science and science that benefits the entire food ecosystem. We would also like to make the scientific community aware of a new opportunity that IFINS has made available. And this is in our spirit of openness and our focus on inclusion of diverse perspectives. We've launched what we're calling an idea portal, and this is available on our website. The portal is an open invitation for proposal submissions on topics that are of relevance to IFINS and which are aligned with the public benefit, of course. This portal is actually perpetually open, so we invite you to visit that link at the bottom of the screen and go ahead and submit a concept. So on to the program today. A second for logistics, this slide shows the control panel. The first item is that you can expand or contract that control panel by clicking on the orange arrow. Second important point is the questions box. Please type in your questions as we go through the presentation at any time. And as we usually do, we'll take those questions at the end. So with that, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Haryam Yadav. Dr. Yadav completed his PhD in 2006 at the National Dairy Research Institute in India, and then he was a postdoctoral, postdoctoral fellow at NIDDK from 2007 to 12. He then went to India for a faculty position, coming back to NIDDK as a scientist in 2014. He then started his own lab in January 2017 at Wake Forest School of Medicine as an assistant professor. And then in 2021, so just this year, he took the role of Associate Professor of Neurosurgery and Brain Repair and Director of the USF Center for Microbiome Research at the University of South Florida. So Dr. Yadav's research focus areas include to discover how gut, the gut and brain communicates and how that's influenced by the gut microbiome. And he also attempts to develop strategies to modulate the gut microbiome for ameliorating gut-brain axis-related disorders such as obesity and Alzheimer's disease. So today he'll focus on his laboratory's work related to the gut-brain axis via microbiome modulators. So with that, we're happy to welcome you, Dr. Yadav. Great, no, thanks Mary for your um, very nice introduction. And um, I would like to welcome everyone and thanks for your time for joining uh, uh, today's talk here. And uh, yeah, I will just talk a little bit about the um, about our research, what uh, we have been uh, doing on this gut-brain communication, and specifically, I will talk today in, about the one topic on uh, how really the gut-brain communication involves in regulating the food intake and how the microbiome and its, their modulators can influence this uh, food intake behavior that can play the important role in regulating the body weight for uh, obesity and, uh, and diabetes. So uh, I just gave the title for uh, our today's talk is protect your brain by taking care of your gut. And I will try to show some of the evidence how really we can uh, do that. Um, let's see. So um, I believe so this is now, um, most of us knows that the microbiome is uh, now has link with any uh, non-human disease. So you name any human disease, you will find the link of the microbiome. Uh, like for example, the microbiome role in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, autoimmune cancer, liver, or any other uh, diseases, including the brain disorders like Alzheimer uh, and others. Right? My lab is mainly focused on uh, one of the area 
uh, where the microbiome plays the important role in obesity, diabetes, in aging and aging related diseases like the Alzheimer disorders. But I will talk mainly about today about the diabetes and obesity uh, projects. Um, as the microbiome role in the human obesity and diabetes was the first one to be uh, discovered by the Jeffrey Gordon and his group uh, in 2006. And they, uh, these are the uh, first few stories came out. The microbiome uh, means the microbiome in the obese people is different than the microbiome of the lean people. And th th that shows that, uh, and they, they proven that the microbiome uh, is not only actually the linked, it is also one of the causal agent which can increase the risk of obesity and diabetes. And this is the kind of classical example of the experiments they have demonstrated was like when they took the microbiome from uh, obese twins versus the lean twins. They, so, so these twins were the homozygous twins because they choose this, uh, uh, these twins because obesity has the genetic component in it. So they want to eliminate the genetic component. So that's the reason they took the homozygous twins, the microbiome from the homozygous twins, but the one twin is obese, one other twin is lean, and they put the microbiome in the germ-free mice and, and feed them on the same, uh, same diet, low-fat, high-fiber diet. But interestingly, what you can see here, the mouse which received the microbiome from obese twins gain more weight increase the adiposity. Whereas the mice which uh, got the microbiome from lean twins uh, remain leaner, suggesting that actually having just the mic transferring the microbiome uh, from obese person to the uh, normal mouse can increase the uh, risk or increase the propensity to gain the more, more weight and increase the adiposity, showing that the microbiome is causal for increasing the risk of obesity uh, and, and diabetes. The question was like how really that that microbiome can um, increase the risk of obesity and diabetes. And then following the story, they also, Jeffrey Gordon Lab also published that is um, the microbiome can increase the harvest of the uh, harvest, like extra calories harvest from the uh, food and that can cause the uh, increase of uh, increased accumulation of the fat. And the, the classical um, experiment, what they did is they took the germ-free mice has no microbiome and put them on high fat diet. These mice remain leaner. Whereas they, they took the another group of the mouse uh, of germ-free mouse, but they colonized them with the uh, normal mouse microbiome. So again, this is these are not the obese, the donor mouse are not the obese donors, but these are just the normal uh, conventional donor mouse or lean donor mouse. And if we put the microbiome in the germ-free mouse. They found that the, feeding them on the same high-fat diet, the mouse having the microbiome increased the more obesity and, 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 and diabetes phenotype, suggesting that, uh, my, and then they also further look on how much calories are coming in their feces versus how much calories are absorbed. They found that the mouse have the microbiome actually their feces has the less calories than the germ-free mouse. And that is showing that the presence of the microbiome actually increases the harvest of the calories from their food. And these extra calories goes into the body and accumulate as a more fat. So that was kind of the one of the uh, mechanisms they, they, they demonstrated. Now, when we talk about, so looking on these evidence that the by saying that the presence of the microbiome is increasing the risk of obesity, then the question comes for the probiotics. Because the probiotics are live, healthy microbes, which basically beneficially affects the host when they are consumed in the uh, sufficient amount. And they are known to modulate the uh, microbiome and any immune system uh, they have been known to be having the several beneficial effects on the whole host health. However, by showing the, uh, the last experiment, which I showed in earlier is by just merely having a normal microbiome increases the risk of obesity, then the probiotics are also the part of the microbiome. Whether the probiotics are uh, safe to be consumed because 
the 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 probiotic consumption is increasing the prevalence of obesity is also increasing so that so the trend uh, basically match the another thing is uh, uh, this uh, documentary or the editorial came in the nature reviews of microbiology uh, so, uh, saying that is uh, basically raising the direct question is whether the probiotics are good or bad for obesity and diabetes and and the reason why they did uh, they raised this question is because the probiotics also have been used in the farming industry as a growth promoter so mostly the uh, animal feed which are supplemented with the probiotics uh, are known to promote the uh, growth of the animals and uh, and and the higher production of the meat right um, they also have uh, given the argument is when the animals um, lose the weight means get uh, treated with the antibiotics they put on the probiotics and they gain actually the weight much more faster right and then the on top of that as i said uh, uh, jeffrey gordon's lab also showed that the, just merely having a pro, uh, microbiome can increase the more uh, risk of obesity that these all combined if uh, facts actually brings the question is whether the probiotics are good or bad uh, for obesity especially uh, and and i think so when when this editorial came there was a lot of uh, uh, chows in the in the whole dietary supplement of the probiotic uh, industry as well as the expert um, and try to say that no probiotics have been used for the long time there is no uh, no uh, evidence that the probiotics are, can be bad for obesity and diabetes but the fact was is there was no data showing that whether the probiotics are good or bad for obesity and diabetes so at that time when i was at nih we started a study by completely independent uh, study by selecting the five common probiotics available in most of the pharmacies at the time and uh, what we did is we designed an experiment where we selected the two control group. One is uh, red, so is the high fat diet control, and then the blue one is the normal chow fat. And then we also took these five probiotics and fed them with the along with the high fat diet to see uh, over the time whether these probiotics will increase the body weight gain or decrease the body weight gain or have no effect on the body weight gain. So. Look, looking on the adiposity and we call this a study as a prevention because we wanted to see the preventive effect of uh, of these um, uh, probiotics um, interestingly what uh, we found is uh, none of the probiotics actually increase the more body weight gain as compared to the high fat diet control at least the what five probiotics we have selected some were more effective to suppress the body weight gain on high fat diet versus the other ones were less effective to gain the uh, to suppress the body weight gain interestingly what we found is one of the probiotics which is called the vsl3 now its name is changed is called the visbiome this vsl3 actually was very effective to suppress the body weight gain and keep these mice as similar as body weight as the normal chow mice are eating so they, it's not like they are making them to have the very low body weight but they are kind of this probiotic is making these mice to maintain the body weight which is very similar to uh, normal body weight they're supposed to have it, right so that was kind of very interesting for us so we followed the vsl3 for further studies how this vsl3 can re uh, reduce the uh, body weight gain um, although this is a prevention study as i mentioned was like very interesting for us however to make it more a uh, uh, translational uh, study uh, really the the limitation of the prevention studies into the human a, humans is uh, we cannot invite the people oh you are uh, normal weight come we will feed you the high calorie diet and we'll give you the probiotic and see whether your probiotic can protect really means it's not even uh, ethically right as well as it means very few people will turn out for for that studies right um, so to make it more therapeutical uh, uh, or more translationally important we we designed another study where we took the obese mouse and see if the this probiotic intervention can reduce the the body weight in, into the already obese mouse and which is kind of the easy i mean similar to the human study where you can invite the uh, overweight or the obese uh, individuals and and then um, uh, intervene them with the uh, probiotics and can see whether that probiotics can help to reducing their body weight or not 
Um, so what we found, uh, what we did is, I'm sorry, what we did is we took these uh, diet-induced obese mice and uh, we switched half of them on the low-fat diet, and then uh, we kept we kept the half of them still on the high-fat diet, uh, plus minus VSL3. And you can see here the VSL3 whether they we switch them on high fat, low fat diet or when we kept them on high fat diet significantly reduce the body weight gain into the into these obese mouse and that was also uh, coincided with the decreased uh, fat mass into both of these these mouse models suggesting that the uh, vsl3 can be effective to reducing the body weight into the obese mouse models then the uh, the question comes is how really, really the VSL3 can reduce the body weight in, in these both of these uh, studies, whether it's a preventive study or whether it's a therapeutic study. So we were also measuring the uh, food intake in these mouse models. And interestingly, what we found is, as you can see here, uh, whether it's a prevention study where the uh, how uh, where these high fat diet fed mice fed with the VSL3 actually decreases uh, or, or maintains their calorie intake very similar to the normal chow fed mice. And, and, and in terms of the compared to high fat diet, they have the less calorie intake. The same thing you can see here in the low fat diet versus the high fat diet, VSL3 mouse does not reduce the calorie intake when they are on the normal chow or in the low fat diet. However, they significantly reduce the high fat diet, high fat diet group. Is suggesting that somehow the VSL3 is reducing the calorie intake on high calorie uh, and risk diet. And that's how it maintaining the lean phenotype here. Now, as uh, as I think so, we all know about uh, the, the body weight maintenance or the obesity is all about the calories, how much calories we take versus how many, how many calories we spend, right? And whenever our uh, input of the calories uh, increases, uh, versus the output of the calories decreases, then that's how the our fat get ac uh, accumulated into the body, right? Um, that when we talk about the food intake versus the output, right? If we talk about the intake, how really this food intake is is, is regulated, and how how I, I will tell you like very a simple uh, example how does that can contribute into the extra calorie intake so for example when we are hungry really nobody tells us oh you are hungry go get the food it means we we automatically start craving and we, that's how we actually start searching the uh, food intake behavior now think about the craving start in the gut because the gut is empty but that is felt by or sensed by the brain and the whole food seeking behavior is dried by the brain right so there is a clear cut gut brain communication is happening right now take the instance where we are hungry we start searching the food because that there is a communication between the gut and brain now when we get the food we start eating the food now when we are full we stop eating the food nobody tells us oh you are full you should stop we automatically stop because our gut is full gut tells the brain stop it right now the imbalance of this communication between the gut and brain can cause the extra calorie intake an example i can give is for example if a one person let's say eat the 30 bites and each bite has let's say um let's say 10 calories each bite right now the another person who whose communication between the gut and brain is not efficient or little bit slow what will happen is that person might eat two or three more bites that's all they doesn't have to really eat the whole another meal the double of the meal but if eating the three or four bites more that means three or so 30 to 40 calories more right that's all but what will happen is in each meal we eat the three meals right in each meal if we eat the 30 to 40 calories per day right per meal per day per week per month how much extra calories we can accumulate and that's how this accounts in our body weight gain and that's that's basically just the few seconds or few minutes 
delay in the gut and brain communication can can uh, can change that dynamic right so this is what the gut brain axis can really make the differences right now we are talking about when we are talking about gut gut is colonized with the trillions of trillions of bacteria right and that they these bacteria can also influence these communication what they this is happening here and then when we are talking about this probiotics this probiotics can actually uh, also influence this gut brain axis and can make it slow communication versus the efficient com communication to be stored and i will show you some of the examples here right so when we were talking about this gut and brain communication mediated to regulate the food intake behavior one of the important uh, uh, axis uh, in the gut and brain communication is the leptin so whenever uh, leptin levels are high uh, normally we stop eating or whenever the leptin levels goes down we mostly this is the hungry state there right so this uh, this communication happens between the uh, uh, fat adipose tissue fat adipose tissue is or adipose tissue basically senses the calories and uh, start uh, releasing or stop releasing the leptin and this leptin has the action receptor into the brain and the brain senses the leptin and that's how actually the whole food intake behavior is derived right so we wanted to uh, see whether vsl3 has any effect on the leptin levels what we found is yes vsl3 sorry vsl3 actually decreases the levels of leptin into the high fat diet induced obese mass so we thought okay the leptin is reduced by the uh, vsl3 and that might be leading to decrease the food intake behavior in that right now when we see about like how that how does really the leptin works leptin works through its receptor called the leptin receptor which is highly expressed in the brain regions um, means the hypothalamic region of the brain and normally what it does is lab when the leptin binds to its receptor it initiates a signaling cascade through phosphorylating the state 3 transcription factor which actually regulate the uh, uh, the some genes which regulates the hunger and satiety signals into the hypothalamic region and the genes or uh, one gene is called the agrp agarty related peptide and npy uh, they are, when the leptin is sensed the expression of these genes goes down uh, when uh, and the other uh, another uh, type of protein or or the gene is called the POMC goes up POMC is the satiated uh, uh, protein and the agrp and npy are the hunger protein so when they are up the hunger signals are up uh, and, and the POMC are up then the satiety signals are up so you can pretty much see here what happened is in, when we feed the vsl3 actually the P STAT3 phosphorylation was up, showing that the leptin signaling was enhanced into the hypothalamic regions. When we look on the gene expression, and you can see here there was a uh, very significant decrease in the AGRP and NPY and very significant increase in POMC, showing that the VSL3 actually switched the set IT and the set IT and the hunger signals, and that is might be leading to decrease the uh, food intake behavior into these mouse models. So we wanted to see whether the VSL3 can also decrease the obesity or diabetes in leptin deficient mouse. So what? So because because if the VSL leptin is the surrogate mechanism for VSL3, then the VSL3 should not be uh, having any effect on the leptin deficient mice because there is no leptin to work through the VSL3. So we feed the VSL3 in 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 the uh, uh, leptin deficient mouse, which is called the lap OBOB mouse. Actually, we found that the VSL3 also decreases the uh, obesity in the leptin deficient mouse too. So then we thought like the leptin is not the only mechanism where the VSL3 can work. This might be a partial mechanism or a, a kind of a, uh, a, a secondary mechanism for the uh, VSL3 to work. So then we started looking on the alternative uh, uh, mechanism. And then the another uh, mechanism for regulating the food intake is called the gut hormones, right? Because when our gut is empty or our stomach is empty, um, then the ghrelin levels uh, are up when, when our appetite is up. But the other um, uh, other gut hormones like the CCK, uh, this is cholecystokinin, GLP-1, PYY, they are decreased, 
right? But when our stomach is full, the ghrelin levels goes down because the appetites so that lead to have the reduced appetite signals. But then the other hormones like um, cholecystokinin, GLP-1 and PYY, they, they go up. So that is the, um, uh, basically the mechanism also regulate the food intake. So we wanted to look on what, what is happening with the VSL3 effects with these mechanisms. So we measure the whole panel of the gut, my, uh, gut hormones onto, onto these different uh, uh, different experiments, like the whether it's a prevention study or whether it's a, uh, it's a therapeutic study or the uh, leptin deficient mouse study. What we found is actually the, uh, the GLP-1 levels. So this was the only uh, one hormone was significantly impacted with the VSL3. Uh, so GLP-1 was sig significantly high into the VSL3 um, uh, high fat diet uh, treated mouse. And also whether they are the uh, low fat diet or the high fat diet in the therapeutic study, the VSL3 also increased the GLP-1 levels. The serum um, the GLP-1 levels were also high in the leptin deficient mice, showing that the VSL3 is increasing the GLP-1 levels, which might be responsible for decreasing the uh, food intake because the GLP-1 is known to be decreasing the uh, food intake uh, behavior into the mouse model. So the another level of the question always comes is, uh, how does the really the microbiome living in the gut lumen can affect the intestinal cells of a human body or the mouse body, right? The mammalian cells, because they mostly the microbiome is separated by a thick mucus layer. So normally the microbes or the bacteria living in our gut do not uh, touch our cells, but they still influence our uh, our host cells. The one of the mechanisms is by producing the uh, metabolites by the microbiome. So we looked on the how does the, this VSL3 probiotic is actually impacting impacting the metabolite production, and what we found is the VSL3 was significantly increasing the levels of the butyric acid. Whether it's a high fat diet list, whether it's a prevention study, or whether it's a therapeutic study, or it's a leptin deficient mouse, it constantly shows that the VSL3 feeding significantly increased the butyrate producing uh, butyrate production into the mouse gut that is linked with the reduced obesity and diabetes, and that was linked with the reduced food intake uh, behavior into these mice. So, based on these findings, what we concluded was is Actually, the high fat diet modulates the microbiome and it's known to increase the obesity and diabetes. However, feeding a high fat diet with the VSL3 uh, reverses those changes by increasing the certain type of beneficial bacteria, which produces the beneficial metabolites like the sorch and fatty acids, uh, uh, for example, butyrate. And we also, although I have not shown the data, we also have uh, uh, challenged the L cells, which secretes the GLP-1, uh, also get stimulated by the butyrate. And this, uh, th that's how they produce the more GLP-1. And that GLP-1 reduces the food intake. That's how they maintain the lean phenotype into the uh, mouse model and have the less incidence of, uh, of type 2 diabetes. However, we also understand and we also, when like, we also found that, uh, so whenever I, I talk to the physician, okay, can we initiate a butyrate clinical study to uh, see if that can reduce the body weight into the people? Um, so, so the question, so when I ask this question, the answer comes no. The reason why the answer comes no is because uh, the, the butyrate doses are needed to be higher, like for example, four to five grams per day. And, and the reason is most of the, all of these butyrate supplements are available into the market. So you can basically get the capsules for the butyrate, but they are mostly present in the sodium butyrate, potassium butyrate, calcium butyrate, magnesium butyrate. And, and then when we talk about, when we talk to the physician, really nobody want to put these salts because the butyrate, four to five gram butyrate will also come the, uh, large amount of the sodium or potassium or whatever these salts you call. No physician want to put the diabetic and obese people or older people who has the higher who has the higher uh, body mass index on this high salt because these this 
particular population already have high risk of these salt related problems so so that's that's the reason there is a lot of uh, means resistance and that that is the reason you can also see in the clinicaltrials.gov that there, there are very few or there are almost none of the studies uh, are uh, are proposed for for that that reason another thing is this higher dose and the low efficacy also comes is because the butyrate is a salt and fatty acid when we take the oral route it basically uh, metabolized by our digestion process uh, and absorbs in the upper part of the intestine as i said the butyrate stimulate the glp1 but the glp1 producing cells are mostly in the lower part of the gut like in the colon we are reaching this um, uh, butyrate uh, is basically uh, is a, one of the biggest hurdle for uh, and cause the high high dose or requires the high dose so what we uh, started uh, uh, doing is why not to develop the probiotic or the characterized bacteria which can increase the butyrate production by utilizing a simple substrate like for example glucose because mostly the obese people have the high insulin resistance and that's how they have the hyperglycemia that means the glucose will be abundantly available not because the, we although we measure the glucose levels only in the blood but the uh, in the diabetic glucose levels are high in in most of the uh, fluids including the intestinal fluids too so we wanted to select the glucose utilizers and most of these glucose utilizers are lactate producers and we also wanted to use uh, to to characterize or isolate the lactate utilizers most of the lactate uh, uh, utilizers are known to be producing the butyrate because they they have a mechanism there so what we did is we started isolating them from the infant diapers uh, and we wanted to make it like more complex uh, consortia of the probiotics by having the different kind of the species and we call that as a probiotic mini microbiome because probiotic has several limitations or there is a lot of controversy about the probiotics whether the probiotics really works or not works and one of the reason is because many of the probiotics are the single strain or the single species or might be the two species one right and what we are talking about is we are talking about changing the whole complex microbiome by just utilizing one or two type of strains or one or two type of the species that is really kind of uh, means it it can happen in the transient way but this really does does not have the much more clinical significance because when we look on the microbiome definition itself the diversity is more important right so really by colonizing the microbiome with the certain types of bacteria will decrease the uh, decrease the diversity there which we, which is not also uh, beni uh, beneficial in the longer term right so we want to kind of increase the different kind of the species there or genera there and they can find their own commensals of the partners and that's how they can increase the more diversity than having the just sending the one type of lactobacilli or bifidobacteria uh, in, in, in this one so that's how we we started compiling this mini microbiome uh, uh, concept uh, there another thing is why means the question comes is why you cannot go with the vsl3 why you want to develop the another uh, probiotics so when when we were kind of working on the uh, vsl3 project because there was an interesting question is vsl3 increases the butyrate but we don't know whether the vsl3 is on bacteria produces butyrate or vsl3 increases the intrinsic butyrate population that increases the butyrate production and we, we were trying to kind of dice, uh, dissect out that and the company does not really want to disclose the much of information about their strains they really like restrict us to culture them so there were so many limitations so that was the another reason we want to have the much more uh, better uh, characterized uh, probiotics also we don't know from where those uh, vsl3 and the other probiotics have been isolated but we want to do this from the human origin uh, from the baby diapers right so that's how actually we started this uh, whole approach is. and what we found is actually we wanted to also test is as I said, the single type of the strains versus the multiple type of the strains, whether they have the different effect on the microbiome, right? And you can see here, uh, what we did is when we, we, we compared the microbiome from the control means non-treated mouse, uh, as well as the 
uh, only uh, five types of five strands of the lactobacilli, but only one one type of the genera. Then we also use the five enterococci, and then we mix them, make make the cocktail of the ten, ten different strands, five from lactobacilli, five from enterococci. And what we did is we uh, we measure the microbiome at day zero, day five after. Uh, after uh, treatments and we have given just the five days treatment and then we also followed them uh, how long these effects will sustain in, on the microbiome when we give just the one week treatment of uh, of this uh, probiotic intervention so uh, uh, so two weeks three weeks and then the five weeks and you can see here uh, the microbiome pretty remains almost uh, similar into the control However, the lactobacilli uh, does change the microbiome. So, for example, from zero due to five, zero, uh, five day, and then the uh, two week, uh, three week, and the five weeks. So, it does change, but but normally, if you if you draw the line, this mostly will be pretty closer. Enterococci also changes the microbiome, and the uh, the cocktail also changes the microbiome. Microbiome, but the cocktail does change the more microbiome than the a single type of the species. And if, this is the, another example you can see here, the microbiome changes are also uh, more prominent in the cocktail as compared to the single uh, type of the genera probiotic, right? We also have looked on the sorts and fatty acid production, and you can see here uh, the cocktail induces the higher production of the beneficial metabolite like butyrate and propionate as compared to the uh, single uh, species, single genera uh, probiotics. We also have done the single dose. We also wanted to see if somebody takes just only one dose, how long these effects will sustain. And we could see that after three days, these effects are washed out. So that so that also shows these uh, probiotic effect on the microbiome are transient, not the permanent. We also looked on the uh, whether these are the, just the mouse uh, effect are only in the mouse or we can also see the similar effect into the human. Uh, we, have, we have done the uh, human microbiome culture studies and you can see here the lactobacilli and enterococci that change the microbiome. However, in the culture system itself has the major effect on the microbiome uh, effects. Also the same thing on the sorts and fatty acid analysis. So, but it, the probiotics that change the microbiome distinctly also, it also has the higher, uh, the cocktail again increases the higher production of the butyrate as compared to the other, as compared to the single genera uh, species. So based on uh, on this um, data, what we conclude here is the one, one week feeding of the newly developed these human origin probiotics uh, changes the microbiome both in human as well as in the uh, mouse models. These new probiotic cocktail also enhance the microbial diversity in the artificial human uh, uh, human fe fecal microbiome culture system. Probiotic uh, uh, feeding as well as the uh, supplementation with the human fecal salary also increases the beneficial metabolite production in human and the mouse microbiome. Uh, we also started asking the other question is, are there any other, uh, are there any other uh, ways to modulate the microbiome and increase the butyrate production? Uh, we also tried the approach of the prebiotics. Prebiotics are normally uh, uh, considered as a food for the uh, good bacteria. And we have isolated the uh, prebiotics from five different types of the food, like for example, acorn fruits, uh, quinoa, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, and sago, uh, based on the different kind of the uh, gradients and the selection process, for example, least contamination of the alkaloids, proteins, as well as the yield of the uh, products, and because we want to do the um, the mouse studies to uh, to feed that. Based on that, what we selected is we selected the two acorn polysaccharide and the sago polysaccharide for further mouse studies. And what we found is, and we also actually compared with the another very standard and well studied uh, prebiotic called the inulin. And you can see here the my the the sago or acorn uh, create the different microbiome signature as compared to control as well as the inulin. Uh, interestingly, when you look on the mic, uh, microbiota profiling, uh, sago and the acorn, they increase the more beneficial bacteria like the bacterioidetes, which are significantly down in, in the obese and diabetic uh, people as well as in the mouse models, and also creates a very uh, strong microbiome 
uh, changes you can see here in this cladogram uh, where the sago has the very prominent effect like the you see this uh, pinkish color uh, uh, the effect on right uh, and then the second one is the inulin also has the very very strong effect however the acorn shows the very uh, very small effects but these red uh, dots also shows the very specific bacteria were proliferated by feeding of these acorns now we also wanted to see whether these uh, uh, these prebiotics are fermentable in terms of reducing the ph of the uh, feces and you can see here uh, yes this acorn and sago they decrease the ph almost very similar to the inulin and also they increases the production of lactate and other sorts and fatty acids uh, very similar to uh, inulin and, and in some cases they were more uh, prominent like for example uh, propionate was significantly increased into the uh, accord and the sago um, uh, fed mice models um, they, the, the feeding of these uh, prebiotics also enhanced uh, the glucose metabol metabolism uh, by uh, suppressing the glucose intolerance as well as increasing the glucose sensitivity uh, the insulin sensitivity into these mouse models uh, they are the feeding of these uh, prebiotics also reduce the accumulation of fat into the uh, adipose tissue we had the fat mass and other measures i am not showing here it also they also reduces the accumulation of fat into the liver so reduces the fatty liver uh, disease into the high fat diet uh, fed mouse uh, one of the other interesting thing what we found is based on the uh, like which can explain the mechanism how these prebiotics can uh, can affect or the uh, the improve the metabolic function is we we saw that the feeding of this sorry feeding of these prebiotics actually decrease the gut permeability as the gut leakiness or gut permeability is significantly high into the uh, obese and diabetic mouse models as well as in the human subjects and that was uh, achieved by increasing the tight junction proteins like the jonulin and occludin expression was significantly increased in the prebiotic fed uh, mouse models we also have seen the brain axis like where the uh, POMC and the satiety inducing uh, uh, gene expression was also increased in, in in these prebiotic fed mouse so based on that what we concluded is uh, these prebiotics like inulin corn and sago all three of them has the beneficial effect on the gut microbiome sorry gut microbiome by reducing uh, the metabolism of the microbiome to reduce the ph um, and increase the sorts and fatty acids like beneficial uh, uh, metabolites uh, butyrate propionate which actually are linked with the decreased gut permeability by increasing tight junction proteins that has the reduced inflammation we also measure the other uh, inflammatory cytokines uh, into the blood as well as in the uh, uh, intestinal tissues as well as it also has the effect on the uh, brain and that's how it actually increases the insulin sensitivity and decreases the type 2 diabetes and obesity in the mouse models now the question comes is okay now we have the this butyrate producing probiotics as well as prebiotics how really we can deliver them to the humans to uh, to to deliver them in human one of the common um, route we we found that is if we can incorporate them in the uh, the milk and and make a yogurt uh, by by combining both the probiotics and prebiotic and we can call that as a symbiotic yogurt so both the probiotic butyrate producing probiotic as well as the butyrate uh, inducing butyrate products and inducing prebiotics and we can increase we can put them together and and make a this symbiotic yogurt so we also find out that is the feeding of the symbiotic yogurt actually suppresses significantly the progression of type 2 diabetes uh, induced by the streptogyotosin and com and combined with the high fat diet however when we were comparing this uh, effect with the with the commercial yogurt we found that the commercial yogurt was somehow increasing uh, the more incidence of uh, type uh, type 2 diabetes or diabetes uh, as compared to even the milk uh, control that was kind of the surprising for us and uh, we repeated this uh, uh, this um, this study for three times and we found the same thing so we are further kind of trying to figure out what what was the wrong with this uh, uh, this particular uh, commercial probiotic uh, 
uh, yogurt and we are also further studying the more mechanism of the symbiotic yogurt to reduce the food intake so i would like to summarize here my talk by just uh, saying the few uh, conclusions here as i hope i have uh, shown the enough data to convince you uh, con by concluding that is the probiotics are not bad for obesity and diabetes even some probiotics can be beneficial for reducing the obesity and diabetes risk uh, gut microbiome metabolites for example butyrate have several beneficial metabolic effects like enhancing or increasing the glp1 production uh, which can uh, contribute in the regulation of the food intake by modulating the gut brain axis uh, and this butyrate can be butyrate production can be increased by the probiotics and prebiotics what uh, uh, what we have uh, newly isolated from the human origin so overall like the take home message uh, what i would like to uh, conclude here is really take care of, of of your gut that can make sense and watch the calories for you uh, rather than we work hard for the uh, other ways to to do that and with that i would like to thank my lab members my former lab uh, uh, uh pi and, and and other lab members and the teams of wake forest school of medicine university of south florida uh, as well as uh, the funding agencies for uh, supporting my research and i would be available on on this uh, context so feel free to uh, reach me anytime i would be happy to take any questions if you have